the, also of the United Nations is a partner. They were with us in the whole process. They even releasing those people uh, this morning. Uh, they were with us. He he was there. Uh, uh, the Syrian government is heading to reconciliation, to forgiveness because uh, there is some mistakes that happen. We can't deal with it in violence. We need to pass those mistakes. You mentioned uh, the first uh, group which came out. What about the others who've come out since then? There's said to be about 300 men who've come out in all. So uh, the second group is 190 uh, uh, men came out, but they came out just yesterday. For that, we need at least 24 hours to study their cases, and uh, they might be released tomorrow or after tomorrow. I just want to say, uh, I hope that the uh, the percentage, the bigger percentage, will all be released. I just want to to add that they are living in a shelter in very good condition. Uh, they have all the services, the health, uh, medical services, and uh, they are all secure. Speaking of the words of uh, a translator, that was Homsa city governor Talal al-Barazi. Now, uh, talking about the situation in Syria, some aid has now managed to get through to Homs and a number mm -hmm. of people have been evacuated. But what is life like for those left behind in a city which is under siege? Well, local resident Abu Rami al-Homsi described the situation. There is no normal life nowadays in, the, in this city because uh, the Syrian regime is cutting out uh, the electricity power and uh, the all necessary materials for the Syrian people here inside homes. The all life uh, activities is off. Uh, shops and markets, all of this kind of lifestyle is really off nowadays. And the people here, civilians, are still in their houses. Uh, they don't have the ability and to choose to went out on the streets. It's very hor horrible, uh, frankly. And inside besieged areas, it's very terrible because there is no food enough for the people. And about these humanitarian aids, which have has been uh, entered inside besieged areas is not enough only for five days uh, then it will be finished uh, this is uh, the daily situation in homes giving us a window into the life in a besieged city that's local resident abu rami al homsi 5 47 times catch up with the latest newsday sports news here's sarah mulcairns <laughs> Hello to you both, and let's begin with football and the age row surrounding the Cameroonian footballer Joseph Manala. He's a youth team player with Lazio in it Italy, and the club have been forced to deny a rumour that the 17-year-old is actually 41. They've released a statement and have threatened legal actions against those persisting with the allegations. Italian journalist Max Evangelista, who reports on Lazio's youth team, says suggestions the player is over 40 are unbelievable. You can never say he's 42. I mean, you know, when you're surrounded by players uh, running like devils uh, around you, like 16 or 17 or 18, it's, you know, my opinion is very tough to be 42. Gordon Iggesund will remain on as coach of South Africa. There had been speculation he would be sacked after a string of poor performances, but he'll now stay on with Bafana Bafana and will name the squad to face Brazil in March on Friday. The Chelsea manager Jose Mourinho believes Liverpool have an advantage in the Premier League title race because they will not be distracted by the Champions League. Liverpool are the only side in the top four who are not involved in the European competition and Mourinho thinks it could be a crucial factor come May. On to Formula One now, and the former world champion Jacques Villeneuve has heavily criticised the sports regulation changes, saying it makes the sport artificial. He has also described the current drivers as highly uninteresting. There will be a number of changes introduced this season, including double points being awarded for the final race in Abu Dhabi. Villeneuve, who has signed to compete in a new rally cross world championship, told the BBC that Formula One isn't the spectacle it used to be. When more than half the field are pay drivers, which means they cannot lose their, their ride, they should at least have a little bit of personality. So but they don't even have that. So they're not fast, they pay to race, and then they're highly uninteresting on top of it. So it's a little bit tough for F1 right now. 
At the Winter Olympics in Sochi, Russia's men got their ice hockey challenge underway with a 5-2 win over Slovenia. There were wins too for the defending champions Canada. They beat Norway 3-1 and the United States eased past Slovakia 7-1. And Zimbabwe's cricketers have ended their two-month strike over unpaid wages and bonuses. That's the sport for now. Thanks, Sarah. We're going to stay in Sochi for just a moment because current weather patterns are causing major headaches for the Russian organisers of the Winter Games. Apparently, well, it's not cold enough around the venue, so there isn't enough snow for some of the sporting events. Pressure's on for Miko Martikainen. He's a snow consultant. His job? To guarantee the smooth running of those Olympic skis. The weather has been uh, changing quite a lot. In January, we had a uh, cold. December cold, now it's abnormal uh, warm, so that's why snow is living material, so it's living every, every day. Warmest spot ever in the history of uh, Winter Olympics, Ruski Gorki Ski Venue, we have perfect competition, 14 degrees Celsius, and the snow compact minus one. So, okay, I think. The words of a confident man, you could call him the Sochi snowman, Miko Martikainen. Now, uh, let's go to South Africa and let me ask you a question. What would you do if you lived in an area where there's been a total breakdown in law and order, faith in the police is low or non-existent, and where gangs and other criminals terrorise the community? Well, for some in the township of Kayalicha in the Western Cape, they've taken matters into their own hands. Details are being heard in a commission which for the past three weeks has been investigating a breakdown in policing. And there have been some harrowing uh, testimonies. He's given. One mother testified how her son and daughter are too afraid to go to school because gangsters terrorize pupils. Another witness showed a photograph of children playing next to the charred remains of a necklaced body lying in an open field. Some people have resorted to necklacing so-called criminals. It's putting a burning rubber tire around their neck. But there are fears that innocent people are also affected. Well, let's hear more about it from Adam Armstrong, who's a criminologist and a journalist who's been covering the story for a community website called Ground Up. Good morning, uh, Adam. Thanks very much uh, for joining us. I mean, the commission has been going on for uh, three weeks, as we say now. I mean, have there been really, really startling details given, or is it something that people around the area are now so used to? Good morning. Um, yeah, it's... To me, one of the biggest things that, that stood out is, is how shocking the stuff that's revealed is and how none of the, the residents of Khalid are that surprised. Um, we've heard lots of stories of, of brutal rapes and murders and cases that drag on for sort of six years with 50 postponements. And, and the residents just kind of nod and say, yeah, that's, that's what it's like here in Khalid I mean, so, you know, the residents, though, aren't now just sitting down taking it. I mean, they've demanded uh, this investigation because they're fed up with what they see as, uh, as police inactivity. I mean, I heard uh, perhaps you can corroborate of a woman who apparently was taken to um, a village where her sister and her niece and nephew had been murdered and she saw the burnt out remains. And apparently they know the man who was responsible, but the police kind of just threw their hands up. I haven't heard that case, but that's, it's very similar to a lot of other cases I have heard, um, where people get released and they're known to have committed a crime and, uh, and the police don't seem to do a lot about it. So what's, what's happened, the other thing that's really surprised me about Kalicha is how most residents don't phone the police. Um, if something goes wrong, they approach the neighbors of the person who robbed them, they approach the family members if they know who they are and say, look, your son, your nephew took from me, what are you going to do? And in some instances, the person returns the goods or the money and, and apologizes. And in other instances, those uh, community gatherings escalate into brutal murders of the person accused of stealing a cell phone or a DVD player or... It's, because, it's fairly random. Because it's one thing if people, you know, speak to those that they feel are guilty and they get a result, you know, get, as you say, 